Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try to speak very slowly uh, so everybody can understand me because it's a weird mixture of English accent with Argentinian accent, which is probably confusing. Uh, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. <laughs> no way I can give this talk in Spanish. I've practiced it in English too many times. <laughs> I've been living in England for 17 years now, so I've actually never done UX in Spanish, so it's great to be here and hopefully have chats with people about how you speak about UX in Spanish, because I have no idea how to do it. Um, I've been working in uh, agencies for about 10 years uh, in the UK and, um, um, and, and I learned lots of things, but I think one of the most important things I learned that is it doesn't matter how good a designer you are, um, if you cannot relate well with your clients, if you cannot get them to buy in on your designs and on your process, um, the end result is never going to be as good as you like it to be because you're going to end up compromising at the end because your clients won't be happy with, with your work. So um, one of the um, ways I learned that you can um, solve this problem is by running workshops. So I'm going to be talking about the things I learned through the years and how to run the workshops and why I think it's a good idea to use them as, as you know, your secret weapon. Uh, but before that, I would like to tell you a little bit uh, of a story. Um, and this story takes place a long time ago. Uh, in a place called Troy, and Troy was a very, very uh, powerful um, city, and um, they they were lucky that they were in a very privileged geographical area, and they had uh, control of a sea lane uh, that took uh, boats into the Black Sea. Now, the Greek Empire, well, at the time, was trying to expand as much as they could. They weren't very happy with it because um, because they needed to pay a lot of money to go through Troy to kind of access the Black Sea. So um, they were looking for an excuse to invade Troy. Um, there were no um, weapon of, weapons of mass destruction in Troy, so they didn't have a very excuse uh, in that sense. But there was another reason that they could use, and that was that um, the prince of Troy decided to kidnap Helen, which was um, the wife of one of the so, uh, Greek emperors. So there you go, they had an excuse to go and um, invade Troy, so off they went. And um, there were thousands and thousands of soldiers, Greek soldiers, going to Troy. And so you you would have expected that it's going to be you know a very quick quick war, a very easy win for them. Um, go and invade Troy and you know take take control of the city and control of the canal that went into the Black Sea. But that's not what actually happened. They actually spent a long time uh, trying to invade Troy and they couldn't do it. And the reason for this was this very very high wall that Troy had built around the city and it was a, a very effective wall. Um, now after ten years uh, of a siege of the Greeks trying to invade Troy. Odysseus, who was a uh, you know, great um, Greek warrior, decided that it was time to think about things in a different way. And instead of trying to enter Troy you know, with brute force, he wanted to think of a way to do it where he was going to make the people from Troy actually allow him into the city. He wanted to give them something they wanted, they wanted so that they would allow him in. Um, so Odysseus went to see his friend, um, Epeius, and he asked him to build him a horse, a big horse, very big and beautiful horse. Um, but he wanted to make sure that the wooden horse was hollow inside, so he could hide a little surprise for the beautiful Troy. So Epeius went and built a horse uh, for Odysseus. And what they did is they put the horse outside Troy, just left it there, and pretended that they were leaving, going away, because they have lost the war, and they were leaving the horse as a present for Athena, the, the goddess that the Greek um, kind of love more the most, and to protect him for the tra their, their travels on their way back. So the Trojans thought that how won the war, they were very happy, and they thought that as you know, as a kind of like nice present from uh, the Greeks, they would take the the um, horse inside the city walls. And so they took this the horse inside the, inside Troy, and then they had a massive party, and they got very very drunk, and uh, and then they went to sleep. And during the night, out of the horse, Odysseus came out with his um, best soldiers, and opened the walls of the city, and then all the Greek uh, warriors went in the city and invade, you know conquered Troy, and that was the end of the story. They they took control of the city, took control of the canal, and the Georgians had to kind of leave the city. I've run away as fast as they could because I'm going to kill them all. And, uh, and that was the end of the story. Now, you're probably thinking, what the hell all of this has to do with UX design? Well, I, I do feel like being a UX designer, um, it feels a little bit sometimes like being Odysseus or standing outside the wall of Troy, you know, looking to this really massive wall and you're kind of throwing things to the other side. Hopefully, they would hit something and that eventually you'll be able to kind of get into the city. But 
but that doesn't really happen. Not doesn't happen by brute force anyway. So I think that um, workshops um, can be a really, really good way of getting through the wall uh, in the same way that um, a Georgian house would do. And it does not only allow you to get through the wall, but also allows you to bring lots of things on the other side of the wall that you want to bring in. So that you can get your clients on your side, and you can get them to understand your processes, and you can get them to support you in your work. So, first of all, I would like to ask you a question before we get into the, the topic of workshops. And that question is, have you ever been a client? Have you ever been to the doctor, or maybe to the mechanic, or maybe had a plumber or electrician do work in your house? Maybe someone fixed your laptop because it broke your phone. Why don't you think about it? Have you ever been applying yourself? And I would like to get back to the moment and try to think about what were you thinking at the time and how were you feeling when you were talking to someone and you, who knew about something that was very important to you, they knew about it much more than you did and you were depending on their advice and their expertise to help you. So maybe Lots of thoughts went through your mind at that time. Maybe things like, I have no idea what they're talking about. And you, you know, you just were too scared to ask any questions because you didn't want to look stupid. So you probably went like, oh yeah, yeah, I understand everything you're saying. And then you went home and that looked things up on Google and tried to learn as much as you could about the subject. Just kind of, you can understand it. Um, or maybe you thought, that's not what I told them I wanted. You felt like, you know, they didn't really understand what they're asking, you're asking them for. Um, so you didn't feel like they were like, listening to you as well as you like. Uh, maybe you thought, I think there's a way to uh, solve that problem. Even if you were talking to someone who had many, many years of experience in that specific area, you still thought, they're not giving it enough thought. I think I can come up with a better solution. Or maybe you thought, I barely know them. Because maybe, you know, say um, someone is fixing your laptop, you never met this guy before, you're just leaving your most precious thing to them. And you don't know them, so why would you trust them that they won't do something horrible to your laptop while you, you, know, you leave them in their hands? So, this is all the kind of thoughts and feelings that you have when you're kind of depending on someone else's expertise and you don't really know the subject as well as they do. So things like the fear of the unknown, uh, fear of losing control of something that might be very important to you. It could be your health, it could be your laptop, it could be your website. Uh, miscommunication as well, that's kind of a problem that you feel that you don't understand each other because you might not be speaking the same language. And the lack of trust problem. So all these problems I feel like are the ones that kind of create this wall between you and your clients or you and the colleagues you might you need to collaborate with. So I think our, our workshops are a great way of addressing these issues um, and um, help you to get through the wall. And I think that every second that you spend with your clients and colleagues is an opportunity. Because the time that you spend together with them, um, just by getting to know them, it helps you to build trust. Um, you can um, educate them. Uh, you can help you to create shared ownership as well of everything you are creating for them and designing. Um, it's a time that you can spend talking to them and listening to them. And, and it's time that you can gain you know, trust. So, what are the kind of things that you can smuggle in your Trojan horse, apart from addressing these problems and curate the wall? Well, I'm going to give you some examples of the kind of workshops I run and the, and the kind of things I think I can get out of them. So, for example, I think about a personas workshop. So, a personas workshop is a workshop um, in which I create personas in a sort of collaboration with my clients. And obviously, what you get at the end of the workshop is a nice set of personas. Um, but not only that, you can also use that as an opportunity to teach your clients about user-centered design. Um, you can and use an opportunity to get them to apply your research findings to a specific task, which means that you actually get them to read your research findings, which is quite a big achievement, I believe. Um, you can also kind of create a sort of empathy between, you know, between your clients and their customers. And, and also they can become user champions. So it can help you to build the personas themselves they probably be kind of defend them across the organization and kind of sell them to other people that will also be involved in the project in the future. Then there is user journeys workshops uh, where you, you know, you hopefully unearth some opportunities for your product by creating a user journey with your clients, but also <coughs> teaching even further about user, user centered design and also how to derive um, requirements from actual user research by doing this together. 
And maybe teaching them a little bit about service design and kind of help them to look at the bigger picture and not just focusing on one specific touch point that might be the website, but get them to think about you know, how all the, all the different touch points might affect the experience. Uh, requirements workshops, which are always very good fun. And we spend a lot of time going through big requirement lists and trying to prioritize them. But you can also use as an opportunity to kind of teach them a bit about Agile and Lean and also to build consensus and make sure that you know, by, the end of, you know, by the end of the workshop and later on during the project, everybody knows what the scope of the project is and everybody has agreed on it and has an ownership of it. So all, these are all the great things you can do um, in workshops. And code design workshops are the most fun of all when you just kind of get the pens out and spend a lot of time sketching with your clients and your colleagues. And you know, again, you kind of get um, more another opportunity to teach them how to use sense design, but also things like responsive design and and obviously shared ownership of the designs, which means that there is not like a moment at the end of the project when you suddenly show them your designs and they you know they really have you know not sense of ownership and they, they start asking you for lots of changes because they don't understand how did you arrive to the science in the first place. And they might become you know, design champions in the organization and really um, uh, talk great things about your work to the people in the company, which help you, you know, will help you in the long term to be able to uh, create better designs and uh, hopefully more projects in the future. So by taking um, the clients and um, colleagues with you through this journey, you know, the whole user centered design process, it means that when you arrive to your destination, everybody knows what you've gone through and why you got you know, to that end point in the first place and why did you get to that end point, feeling the way the way you do and the decisions that were made in the way. So hopefully that means that you know, you know there won't be like a last minute change when suddenly your client or your colleagues ask you to change everything you've done without you know a very well thought out rationale of based on research and, and and the old kind of you know creative process that you've gone through. So I hope I convince you of how great workshops are after all this that you actually think that it's a good idea to run workshops with your clients. So now I would like to spend a little bit of time telling you about, a, a little bit about how making sure that the workshops are effective and, and that you actually fun, have fun you know, running them and the people who come to your workshops have fun too and that actually you get some really good results out of them. So let's talk about how to build and deploy your very own designers Trojan horse. So the first thing you need to do uh, when you start a workshop, in the same way that when you design a website, you need to design your strategy. What is that you want to get out of the workshop? So, for things that we've seen before, you know, there are things about creating shared ownership and building trust that always should be part of what you want to achieve. And there might be some specific deliverable that you want to have at the end of the workshop, like a set of personas, for example. But there might be other other things um, that you know might be useful for you. Maybe um, getting the buy-in of specific stakeholder in the project um, or solving some kind of issues between the project team that needs to be addressed. So there might be other things that, that you want to achieve with, the, with, with your workshop. So make the most of it, think it very well beforehand so you make sure that you plan your workshop around this strategy. Then it's time to pick your participants. So it could seem very obvious to think, oh well the participants in my workshop will be the people who know the stuff I want, you know, I need. But sometimes there are people who doesn't really know much about design or doesn't really even know much about the project, but other people who actually will make the decisions at the end of the project, whether you know that design is right or not, whether it's being signed off or not, whether there is money for the next phase of your project. So even if they, you think they don't know much about anything that of use in your workshop, you still want to invite them you know, to take part because you want you want them to feel, you know, feel part of your team, you want them to be on your side. Um, and then obviously people who have you know specific knowledge of the users or whatever is that you you know you need for that workshop are the people who you're gonna invite. Then um, it's time to decide on the activities you're gonna be running in your workshop. Now um, there are many ways you're gonna select your activities, and so it might be around the deliverables you want to get at the end of the workshop. But it might also have to be, you know, related to the type of participants you have. You know, how important the people in the workshop is, what kind of mixture of people there is in the in the workshop, uh, whether it's some like kind of really big boss, you know, that's coming and is going to be joining in. So you means that you need to plan things around that as well. Um, you want to make sure that the workshop is like any experience. You want it to be a great experience. So in the same way that you design is maybe a website, an application, or any kind of digital experience. You want your workshop to be, as well, a great experience from beginning to end. You want it to flow, you want it to feel like the right thing, and the people at the end of the, after the workshop, they live feeling you know, quite happy that they took part. 
So when it comes to um, selecting activities, I mean, it's amazing what you can do just with this. You know, with posting notes, sticky notes, sharpies, paper. That's all you need for most of the activities you ever do in your workshop. Um, so yeah, there is no excuse for saying that you know you can't you know you can't run a workshop because you have enough stationery or whatever that you think you might need. Um, so you know having those tools always available that means that you know you can always be ready to run any kind of workshop you need. And there is also a really great resources, uh, lots of books give you lots of ideas about what kind of activities you can run. Obviously there is also kind of going to you know, conferences as well. You know you learn about great activities if you go to workshops that people run, you know, at the moment in the conference, you're probably learning about, you know, the kind of activities you might workshop yourself with your clients. But there's a, a great book, there's one of the ones I refer to most, called Gamestorming. Um, and the great thing about Gamestorming, they not only give you lots of ideas about the kind of activities you might run, but also teach you how to create uh, your own activities, your own games. So that's quite good, because it, it gets you to understand, you know, how games are created and what makes a good game. Another thing to have in mind when it comes to um, running a workshop is um, how you balance uh, group activities with individual activities. Now, group activities are great for people to kind of gain confidence at the beginning of a workshop because they, you know, there's not so much pressure on themselves to come up with anything, and they can build on each other's ideas. And there's, you know, the limelight is not in one specific person. So in that sense, they're really, really good. But it's good always to mix group activities with individual activities. Uh, part of the reason for this is to do uh, with um, social conformity. Um, there have been lots of studies around social conformity, which um, they prove that in one of three um, scenarios, what will happen is the people in the group will follow whatever the most powerful person in the group thinks. Which means that if you're always running group activities, you're probably going to be missing the opinions and voices of lots of people in the room. So you want to make sure that you give the opportunity to those people to also be able to express themselves and express their, uh, their voice their opinions when you workshop. So it's nice to kind of uh, balance the two types of activities. Also think about the different personality types, like introverts, you know, against extroverts. Some people uh, need time to, you know, think by themselves to come up with good ideas. Other people come up with good ideas by talking to others. So it's good to have that in mind as well when you're deciding, you know, the kind of like activities you're going to be running, whether it's a group activities, individual activities. Then there is another thing that you need to balance in the workshop which creates the structure of the workshop. And that is opening activities and closing activities. Now opening activities are an activity where you create lots of, um, lots of choices, um, lots of ideas. And the closing activities when you start kind of making choices. So let's say for example you are running a design workshop, a co-design workshop. And the first thing you want to do is like people to come up with ideas that they might have uh, in a specific page. And so you know you want to do an open activity and get people to come up with as many ideas as they can. And after after a while, when they come up with lots of ideas, what you want them to do is start kind of narrowing down and deciding which are the best ideas. So you can use things like sticky dots, for example, to get people to put sticky dots in you know prefer ideas and things like that to make it kind of quite democratic. And that kind of, that kind of is a closing activity, you're starting kind of narrowing down. But then after you have all the ideas and you know the ideas you're really working around, you know the ideas you're going to be designing for, then you might decide, okay, now it's time to do lots of sketches. And you want people to do as many sketches as possible. And maybe do something like all six up, when you get people to do six different ideas for one specific page in a short amount of time, really quickly. So everybody's generating lots of ideas again, but this time in sketches. And again, you want to start kind of narrowing down because you don't want to kind of end up, you know, at the end of the workshop with a million of ideas and not really having a clue of which ones are the ones that are more, you know, preferred by, um, by the people in the team. So then again, you want to do some kind of prioritization or selection and narrowing down. And you can go through the cycle of opening activities and closing activities several times through your workshop, depending how long the workshop is and what you're trying to achieve. And by the end, obviously, by the end of the day, hopefully, you will close your workshop with that closing activity. So that's kind of as simple as it is you know, when it comes to structuring workshops. Now, you know what your strategy is, and you created a plan around that strategy, and you're kind of ready to kind of start your workshop. You want to make sure that the room you selected creates the right atmosphere. So it's silly, but I mean, I don't know how it's around here, but. It's always a meeting room issue where you know you can never find enough meeting rooms or big enough meeting rooms or meeting rooms with light or you know a kind of any kind of room where you can run a workshop that is not like not a horrible 
um, you know, pristine room with nothing uh, on the walls and no natural light. So if you can book that, you know, take you know, as much as advance as possible so you can get a good place, that's great. But um, it's not only about finding the right room, it's like what you do with the room as well can be, uh, can be really important and make a very different, uh, for a very different atmosphere in the workshop you're running. So I personally um, like to go for this look when, uh, when it comes to my workshops. Uh, I call it the kindergarten look. Um, and it's, if it's possible, just put things on the walls, put lots of toys around, just lots of colour pens, whatever you can bring in, doesn't matter how silly it is, that bring a little bit of colour to the room. And uh, that will make people a little bit more relaxed because you're probably going to be doing a lot of creative stuff. You need people to feel relaxed. Because, um, and I always sometimes, um, if say I'm working with a client and they're in a big organization where they tend to like, have to dress up to go to work, if I'm running the workshop in my own space, I tell them to dress down so to kind of not come in suits or anything like that so they can be a bit more relaxed. And also, it's quite amazing the difference you can make the layout of the room. So the way that the tables and chairs are laid out in the room can actually make a really big difference in the dynamics of the group. Um, like the one layout I hate most, I don't know if you've seen it, I don't know if how much you can hear, but they call it horseshoe, where you've got these kind of tables like laid out in this kind of fashion where everybody's looking at each other, but with a massive gap in the middle. And I think that's kind of the worst layout you, you, know, you can have for a workshop because people are not able to connect properly and, and, and really have like, you know, close conversations. So just play around with the way you lay out tables, depending obviously what kind of activities you're going to be doing. If you have separate groups, obviously you'll have people around one table, whatever that is. But you know, have that into, um, in, in, you know, in your mind when you when you get to the room you're going to be using and think, you know, do I need to change anything around, um, in the, you know, the tables and the chairs. So so you've got your room and everybody's there and you're gonna gonna start your workshop and. Now it's time for you to lead them, you know, through whatever activities you're going to be running through the day. And at this time, it's very important that you earn the respect. And obviously, this is not just for the workshop, but it will have an impact in, you know, in the way that you can relate to your clients and colleagues through the rest of the, of the project. But during the workshop, it's the time that you can actually achieve this, which is earn your participant respect. And, and this is because respect is, you know, it's not something that is given. It's something that you have to earn from people. And the, and the way you earn is first of all by respecting yourself and respecting my, you know, others. And I think that a useful tool that you can use uh, to learn um, how, how to earn people's respect when you run your workshops um, is the assertiveness model. So assertiveness is a communicational and behavioral style based on mutual respect. And being assertive means that you express yourself eff effectively and stand up for your point of view. Uh, while also respecting the rights and the beliefs of others. So according to this model, there are uh, four ways, uh, four modes uh, or, or styles of communication and behavior. Oh, you can see three here, but I'm not crazy, you'll see in a minute. Um, so the first one is uh, the passive uh, communication style. And people who are passive tend to avoid expressing their opinions and feelings. Uh, they don't protect their rights. Uh, or meet their needs. So they say yes, but they don't mean to say yes. And they allow, uh, you know, things build up inside, you know, because they're putting up with lots of things they don't really want to put up, but they don't agree with, until at some point they explode. And they feel really uh, ashamed of the fact that it exploded, and so they go back to the passive style again. Then we have um, aggressive communicators, and aggressive communicators, uh, sorry. My notes, but um, so aggressive communicators express their feelings and opinions and they fight for their needs in a way that violates the rights of others. Um, so they can be um, verbally and physically abusive and they might be talking insulting, humiliating and manipulating others uh, as a way of getting what they need. Uh, so not very pleasant for the other people in the room. Um, and then we finally have passive-aggressive communicators, and these people are behave a little bit like uh, prisoners of war. So on the, on the surface they are being passive, and they, um, you know, like they're kind of happy to, you know, to go along to whatever they say. They look a bit, you know, similar to the passive style, but um, they're trying, like, quietly to sabotage everything that's going on around them. So in the same way, a prisoner, prisoner of war, they might sort of make fun of the enemy or quietly disrupt the system uh, while smiling and appearing cooperative. That's the way passive-aggressive people behave. 
And finally, last but not least, is um, the assertive um, style of communication. This is the one that we're aiming for and the one that will earn you people's respect. Um, so assertive communicators are able to clearly state um, their opinions and feelings and uh, advocate for their rights and needs without violating the rights of others. So they value themselves at the time uh, and take responsibility for any choices they might make. So just to give you a little bit of more um, information about assertive style. So they state their needs and feelings clearly, properly and respectfully. Um, they use I statements, which means that they own what they say. They're not kind of saying, you know, you say this or people feel that. You have to say, I feel this and I believe this. They speak in a calm and clear tone of voice. Um, they don't allow others to abuse and manipulate them. Uh, and they stand up for their rights. And very importantly, they listen well without interrupting. I'm going to give you just a few examples just to kind of learn a little bit more about this. Although, you know, laying a sentiness, you know, I would kind of recommend you go on to read more about it. But just, just to give you more of an idea of how it might look like sort of in a work environment. So say you're stating your feelings in a work environment and, you know, someone is being um, annoying you, constantly asking you for things throughout the day and just can't get anything done. So you can answer to them in an assertive way, which is, I find it difficult to focus on my work if you keep sending me these questions. Can you please put them all together and we can spend some time tomorrow resolving your doubts? Now, what you're saying here is that you're stating your feelings in a very clear manner without you know, resorting to you know, any kind of uh, aggression towards the person who's asking you these questions. And at the same time, you're addressing their needs by providing them an alternative. Uh, then, for example, a discrepancy. So, um, someone... Um, they say you're in a workshop and you're kind of all agreed and you know you follow you know the, what's the you know the favorite idea and you're gonna kind of move on to your next activity but someone start kind of suddenly contesting that idea and wanting to come up with other ones. So you can say to them, I believe you agreed that the idea with most votes will be the one taking forward. Why are you asking to discuss the ideas again? So so you can state this is the agreement we made earlier. We all made it um, and this is kind of the discrepancy. So again, you are not kind of being aggressive towards them, you're kind of respecting what they're saying, but you're kind of just pointing out that, you know, they're kind of being a little bit unreasonable. Um, so priorities for another last example. Um, I understand that you need this urgently, but I have another deadline today. Can we talk about this first thing tomorrow? So in this case, again, you're stating the need of the other person, you know, that they, you know they're coming to you with, with something that they need from you. But you're saying, well, I actually have this need myself. Um, and then you're providing an alternative. So you're not ignoring them, you know, ignoring what they're telling you, you're kind of respecting the fact that you know, they, they, they have a need. But you also have your own, and you're trying to come up with a way of you know, finding a solution that addresses both. So you know, assertiveness is something that takes time to learn, a lot of practice. And be, you know, it's great to learn you know, a bit, a bit more if you can. Uh, but you know, in a nutshell, it's about you know the fact that you must respect yourself and others if you want to be respected. So let's say you you know gain the respect of the participants in your workshop now. And as I say, respect is all about um, the rights. It's about kind of setting the right boundaries. And another way to help you set boundaries in the workshop. So not only are you you know you're being respected, but everybody else is respecting each other as well in the workshop. Is setting rules from the start. So at the beginning of each workshop, I always do this and come up with a set of rules, uh, which can be things like mobile phone off. <coughs> Anyone got the mobile phone off? Just in case. Uh, laptops closed. Only one conversation we got at once. Everybody must participate. So these are the ones that I normally have, and I might other things if needed. Um, and that you know, just kind of coming up with rules from the beginning of the workshop makes a big difference. But one of the really important things for the, make the rules work is that at the beginning of the workshop you ask people whether they agree with them. You ask them if they're happy with the rules, if there's anything they want to change about the rules, if they want to add any new rules to the list or take any off the list. Because it's one day uh, participants actually have a sense of ownership of the rules is that they're going to be adhering to them, otherwise they will just ignore them. Um, so once they kind of agree that they're happy with the rules, and you might have to you know, change it. I mean, a lot of the times happened to me that you know, ask for people to you know switch off their mobile phone, and someone said, "Well, actually, have this very important call at you know, three o'clock." So you know, it's very simple. Well, you need to have that call at three o'clock. You leave the room, you have your call, and then when you're done, you come back, and it's simple. Um, so try not to come up with too many rules because then people won't be able to remember them. If you can post them up on a wall so everybody can refer to them and uh, through the day. 
But it's quite amazing how effective they can be. And you know, if somebody kind of break the rules, it might even have to be you who have to kind of put them in the place. It will be someone else, you know, one of the participants who might say to them, you know, hey, you're not allowed to have your mobile phone on. So a great way of you know getting the group to self-regulate and respect each other throughout your workshop. Okay, so so you have your rules. Um, so everybody knows where they're standing, and you're ready to start with activities. Now, if you're working with a group of people that has never worked together before, or you know maybe they work together in the, you know, in the same organization, but or in the same company, but that doesn't mean that they used to do kind of um, creative work together. So you want to kind of give them an opportunity to kind of ease themselves into this slowly. So you can do like some really silly activities to warm them up, to kind of get them comfortable with each other. Um, so, uh, there are lots of warm up exercises. I'm not going to kind of start giving you examples here because they can, you know, they can, it really depends the kind of people you're working with. Um, but there are loads and loads of resources on the web that you can look at. I hope, you know, also like books like the, the Big Book of Icebreakers. There are even little packs of cards that you can get that have like some really like, silly conversation starters and activities. Um, but yeah, I really recommend that if it's the same time, the first time you're running a workshop with a group of people, that you always kind of come up, you know, come up with some activity, warm them up first before you get into, stuck into the actual view, you know, hard work. Then, um, once you participants start working and they're coming up with ideas, the next thing you need to do is listen. Now, this is very essential, and it's not only essential, uh, you know, for an assertive communicator. As you see, it was one of the things in the list for assertive behaviour. So listening is not only about being an assertive communicator, but it's also about being a great designer. So um, Michael Brierich, who's I don't know if you've heard about him, he's kind of well-known designer, quite famous. Um, he um, he's often uh, told that clients really like him because he's listened to everything they say, and um, he sees himself as a bit of like a, a doctor. So um, he sees his clients as patients, and he believes that if he listens to his patients hard enough, you know, with enough focus, that they're going to actually give him the solutions. Um, so he doesn't he seems to be a facilitator, he doesn't see himself as someone who come up with all the solutions himself, but facilitates the, his patients into coming up with the solutions that they need. So uh, for, him, for him being a, a good designer, you know, you need to be able to be a good listener as well. But what is it to be a good listener? Well, being um, a good listener is not about hearing, a hearing is different from listening. So when you're listening, you're actually focusing the other person, and not only focusing on the sort of verbal communication, um, you're also focusing in other kind of uh, language, so for example, body language. So you're actually trying to capture the full message that the other person is giving you. So you're just kind of listening to the words, trying to make sense of them, but also kind of looking at them and trying to kind of understand what the body language is also telling you. And um, your ability to listen uh, effectively depends on the degree to which you perceive and understand these messages. So, however good you think your listening skills are, the only person who can judge whether you're a good listener or not is the person you're actually listening to. And a very good way to find out whether if you actually are a good listener is to start using what is called reflecting. So when you're reflecting, what you do is you repeat back to what the other person tells you. Uh, and you might repeat it back in your own words, or you might have repeated it back in a very similar way that the person told you whatever it is that they told you. And in this way, you'll be able to check what we understand of what they said is correct or not. And uh, reflecting is, is great for many reasons. Uh, one is like it forces you to focus on the other person, because you cannot reflect back to the person told you if you're not really listening to them properly. Um, but also it's very good to kind of get people speaking. Um, when, when you're reflecting back, people feel much more motivated, they kind of think, oh yeah, that's, I'm actually being listened to. And they actually keep speaking you know, much longer than they would otherwise. So, so reflecting is really great, because you know, it helps you to focus, but also you know, helps you to get uh, people talking more and telling you more interesting things. Now, sometimes you're being great, you're being assertive, and you're being a great listener, but you know, you got this feeling that it's like, you know, you're a boat, you know, going towards an iceberg, you know, like slowly, you know, getting closer and closer and things are going to go really badly because people are not agreeing about things in your workshop. You're kind of going around the houses for ages, going around in circles, and, you know, people are just not in your workshop and not agreeing about something very important. And now in this situation, um, something that you can use, which is very helpful, is uh, what is called position, interest and needs model. Now, the position of interest and needs model uh, 
um, Casa is, is based on the fact that uh, I um, they believe that the idea is that um, there are very few basic needs that everybody has. And people pursue uh, these needs by having certain interests. And then they create positions which they believe will satisfy these interests and needs. Now, I think the best way to explain this is for example. Um, but position is what people say they want. Interest is what they really want. And a need is what they actually must have. So, let's say that client came to you and uh, you can give them a design and the thing they came up with is that they want you to make the logo bigger. Bigger, 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 much bigger. And you know, you're trying to say to them, look, you know, the, the logo is taking all this space that can be used for much, you know, many more useful things that you know, we need to include in this page. You know, the, you really shouldn't do that, it doesn't look right. And you might have, you know, have a discussion with them and trying to kind of make them say, you know, why, you know, all these reasons why they shouldn't make the logo bigger. But instead of doing this, what you can do is you can start asking them questions and trying to understand why do they want to make the logo bigger. So if we go back to the position, interest, uh, and the model, um, you, uh, you can say, okay, the position that they have is that they want, you know, they want you to make the logo bigger. But if you start asking them, it might be, you know, interesting reasons why they want you to make the logo bigger. So it could be that they, you know, they think that's the way that they want to increase brand awareness. So it could be that their boss designed the logo and they think that the boss is going to be happy with them if the logo is really big because show how great, you know, how great the boss is. Um, but let's say in this case, the interest is uh, to increase more, uh, brand awareness. So now that you know that is the reason why they want to make the logo bigger, you can try to find other positions uh, that will address this. So, you know, you can say to them, well, you want to increase brand awareness, you know, we can talk about marketing communications, we can talk about copywriting, we can talk about the look and feel of the website, you can talk about uh, social media strategy. You can start telling, you know, giving out other, other ways that they can address this interest, which is kind of increasing the brand awareness. Until you're making the logo bigger, it's not such a big thing anymore. So this is a really good way of, um, you know, getting people to agree um, on things and not kind of being stuck, you know, in a specific, you know, each one in a specific position. And um, if you kind of dig a little, a little bit deeper and try to understand why, you know, you know, it's really important for this person to increase brand awareness, um, you might find other things like, for example, that, you know, say it's a small business owner, so it might be that, you know, they, their identity is uh, very much attached to their brand. So the sense of identity is being threatened if the you know the brand you know awareness is not good enough. So by understanding what their actual underlying need is, it would really help you to empathise with your uh, client or whoever it is that you have a discussion about, um, because we all have needs and the needs are all the same. They are universal, which means certainly you can see you know from you know from their point of view you know why is that you know they're feeling really threatened about something you think is really silly. Um, you can empathise with them and hopefully you'll be kind of more well, we willing to help them out in this because you, you know, you, 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 you've been in a similar situation in the past as well. Now, sometimes you know everything, right? You kind of been assertive and you are uh, being a good listener, and you kind of trying to get people to agree on things. You send the, 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 you know, the right model, like looking at the interests and all this sort of thing. But there's someone in the workshop that is being incredibly annoying. Uh, they might be pushing your buttons or the buttons of other people in the workshop and not letting them get on with their work. Now as a facilitator, it's, it's your responsibility to make sure that you take control of these difficult personalities. You can't just like, let them run riot and ignore them and you know, disrupt the whole workshop for everybody else. Now there is kind of another model that I found really useful that works quite well with assertiveness, or if you don't get on very well with that one, it's something you can use instead. And it's more uh, focused around group dynamics as well, so it's really helpful for that. And that is transactional analysis theory. Some of you might have heard of this already. It's been Argentina and all that. <laughs> the obsession with psychology. Um, so transactional analysis, um, they, they talk about three different ego, ego states. And um, the ego states are parent, adult, and child. And the first ego state, parent, uh, can be expressed in two different ways. as a nurturing parent and controlling parent. So they believe that we, we all kind of fall into different ego states at different times. So if you're following the parent ego state, the nurturing um, ego state, uh, it, it, the nurturing ego state will kind of incorporate external sources. So people that in your life, by the way, that your parents or have kind of parental responsibilities of you, you absorb you know, their behaviors 
and then they kind of become part of you. And when you're expressing your parent ego states, those are the things that will come up. So if you have really enough of nurturing and controlling parents, that's probably what will kind of come up. You, you know, you probably have different uh, role models in your life um, that you had when you grew up. So they probably have a little bit of um, both uh, in your sort of behavioral set. Then there is the adult ego state. And the other state is um, where you actually focus in the present, you're focusing on facts, um, and it's um, nothing to do um, with age or anything like that. You can kind of be kind of fall into your adult state at any age. And it's a kind of behavior concerned with collecting information and organizing and analyzing. And the behavior that you have when you're in an adult ego state is appropriate to the situation uh, that's being experienced at the time. So it's focusing the here and now, and you're not kind of sort of reflecting back anything that happened to you in the past or anything like that. And then um, finally we have the child legal state. And the child state contains um, you know, any kind of impulses that any infant might have. And it can be expressed in two different ways. One is a free child, um, which is kind of spontaneous, energetic, curious, loving, and inhibited. And then this adapted child that develops when you learn to change um, your feelings and behavior in response to the world around you. So it's kind of adapted to the kind of situations you live through. Now, just to give you a, a, a little idea of how you can use this uh, in a workshop situation, let's look at an example. So, let's say that someone in your workshop is uh, falling into the child ego state and they're just, just being a pain, they just don't want to do what you ask them to do, they're just kind of being a bit spoiled and it's just kind of difficult for you to handle. So, what would normally happen if someone is, because, is kind of falling into the child ego state, what you'll do is you're kind of gonna fall in the adult state, you're kind of going to go into the opposite way. So you're going to end up stuck in this dynamic or game, as it's called intersectional analysis, where because a person is behaving like a child, you're going to start telling this person off like you would a child, uh, and you fall probably in a controlling point ego state. Now, that's not really appropriate because they're not your child, you know, you're in a kind of work situation, you're in a workshop, you should really not be telling your participants off at the workshop. So by using this model, um, you can actually become sort of conscious of what is actually happening and avoid this. So instead of falling for a parent ego state and then like having this kind of like, I'm telling you off and the other person is behaving badly, um, what you have to do is try to you know, get back to your adult um, ego state. And if you get back to your adult ego state, the other person will have any choice eventually you back to fall in the adult ego state too. And then you'll be able to have a like, much more rational conversation about what's happening and hopefully you know, get back the dynamics of your workshop back into track. So transactional analysis can be really helpful to kind of understanding our behaviors and the sort of behaviors of people around us. Um, and yeah, so you can pick which one you want, assertive behavior or, or transactional analysis. Um, now, another way to address um, difficult participants in the workshop as well, um, I find that using individual activities really good. You know, when we talk about group against individual activities, if you've got someone that's being really difficult, you can always fall back to say, okay, we're going to be doing um, you know, this activity which say, for example, everybody has to kind of work on their own and you just write things on post-it notes and then we're going around the table and one person at a time have to say what they've written down, for example. And that means that you know, everybody has the same voice and nobody can take over and there's very clear rules. And it means that you know, if someone who's being quite disruptive, they, you know, they, they have as much room you know, to be as disruptive as they would like to. And then you can make up your own rules. And one rule I kind of came up with, for example, uh, for a series of workshops I was running with a group of people where there were some like, kind of very opinionated characters, you know, some people who were very, very vocal and they're kind of speaking for ages and not let anybody, anybody else speak. So what I did is come up with a rule, which was uh, the 60 seconds rule, and I had a timer on the table, and, they, and the rule was that nobody was allowed to speak for longer than 60 seconds without letting other people you know, answer back to what they were saying. And it was really interesting because I actually never had to use the timer. Uh, I just had the timer on the table, and if somebody was going to start, you know, a really long, you know, monologue about what they thought about everything in life and the universe. I just had to look at the timer, and you know, and everybody at the table knew what that meant, and they all looked at the timer and they looked at the person. The person felt really embarrassed, and they stopped talking, which was great. Um, so yeah, you can be creative and come up with any kind of rules that might help you to address specific, you know, characters that you have to deal with um, in your workshops. And then, what, once everybody's, you know, saying that there is, you know, everything under control, everybody's carrying on with activities, there is no difficult personality, so they're all under control. 
and you know everybody's kind of getting really creative. The next thing you need to do is to do nothing. <laughs> you need to stay out of the way. So I know that as designers, it's really hard to step back and not get you know do all this work yourself and be creative and you know, coming up with ideas and do you know everything yourself. Um, but if you're in a workshop situation, the idea is that you want to capture everybody else's ideas and get them to feel you know ownership of what they do you know what they do in the project. You have plenty of chances when you go back to your desks later on um, to kind of refine everything that you know that came up in the workshop and kind of work further into it. But while you're um, while you're in the workshop, is the opportunity of your participants um, to be creative and to come up with, with ideas. And you might guide them a little bit, but um, but you want to stay out of the way and just kind of listen to what they go say and just let them kind of come up with things themselves. And obviously, I'm not telling you just leave the room and let them get on with it because that's that's not great either. What you should do is just step back and then you just keep an eye on the room. And if you know, if it's a group is kind of coming, you know, it's working on an activity, um, if they need you, you know, if they need you to help you, they're going to make eye contact with you, and you know that you know they want you there. If they're not looking at you and they're stuck in doing their own thing, just don't go and say, "Oh, what are you doing?" And you know, "Oh, well, you could do this, you could do that." That's the most disruptive thing you can do. So just keep an eye on the room, and if people want you or need you because you know that's stuck in an activity or because someone's been a bit annoying, they'll, they'll look for you, and you'll know that they need you then. So yeah, so stay out of the way. And uh, last but not least of the uh, tips for workshop facilitation um, is um, celebrate. Now this might seem really silly, but Every time you finish an important activity or achieve a milestone in your workshop, so you get to the end of the workshop, it's really important to celebrate the achievements of the people who are taking part. Um, because it makes them feel, uh, first of all, it makes them feel like, you know, that whatever they've done in the workshop is valuable. And they will leave feeling a kind of great sense of satisfaction when they leave the workshop. They'll be more motivated to come back to other workshops that you might run. And they will also tell great things about the thing, you know, about how, you know, the workshops that you run. So if you need other people, in, you know, in the company to come and help you in workshops, they actually will be more willing to give up their time to come and take part. And I have this, you know, happen to me where, you know, I started running some workshops and people, you know, I started telling all, all the people in the organization to a point where I actually have to <laughs> say I didn't have time to do more workshops because everybody wanted to get involved, you know, get stuck in and do things because I thought, you know, they had a very, very good fun. So, so yeah, it's just kind of like celebrate it and thank them for the work they've done uh, and make them feel that whatever they've done is really, really valuable. And also as well, like if you're representing an agency or a company, whatever that is, um, if people leave your workshops feeling happy, that reflects very well on you and also in, you know, in the agency you're representing, which is really what you want because you're, you know, you're representing your, your own brand when you're running a workshop. So I hope you find this really, really useful. And, and, and I just want to show you now your certified church and horse builder. I mean, I think that with, you know, tips I give you, if you, t you know, if you take them on board, you're going to go out there and you're going to run some really, really, you know, great workshops and you're going to have lots of fun doing it. I mean, the more you do it, the more confident you are, I can assure you, you want, you, you want to keep doing it because it's really, really good fun. And it makes your work easy and it makes other people do your work for you. When, I mean, what else can you ask for? I mean, it's just, <laughs> um, I, I find it great. I've got my, my clients who are paying me doing a lot of the work that I should be doing uh, in my workshops, which I think is, is really good. So, so I think about you running lots of workshops, hopefully you address all these issues that create walks between you and your clients and your colleagues, like things like the fear of the unknown and the losing control and miscommunication and lack of trust. All these, hopefully, will be addressed just by spending time with them in the workshops and doing things together. That's not actually what the workshops are about. Uh, but you can get much, much more out of it if you want to. So, um, so I hope everything you learned today uh, will help to bring down the walls that stand between you and achieving UX greatness. So, thank you very much.